Hello everyone, I'm Linda Nickel and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every Wednesday, photographers at all levels meet here on Zoom. And for almost two years and over 100 sessions of the Happiness Hour, my goals have always been to help us all connect, to inspire and to create. And with the help of a guest that shares their images, stories of inspiration and some tips to help you improve your own photography skills. The schedule for our upcoming presentations is on my website at lindanickel.com, as well as the links to previous sessions on my YouTube channel. If you are in the Central Texas area, take a look at the event that is listed for Saturday, March 19th, because the Happiness Hour will be an in-person, all-day event at the Georgetown, Texas Photography Festival. My guests will include Elise Bender, who will talk about exploring Texas nature, Pennsylvania-based nature and landscape photographer Valerie Hoffman will be there to present Kickstart Your Composition in her session. Portrait photographer Jama Pantel will show you how to pose with confidence. Art teacher and still life photographer Karen Riley published her first book and she will share some of her tips in her presentation from idea to ebook to Amazon. Landscape photographer Rob Doyle shares his love for West Texas in his presentation, Capturing the Magic of Big Bend National Park. And Andrew Vaughn will come in from Houston to talk about the power of video for social media. And he's gonna share some of his tips to get you started in using video in your own work. And for those of you that will not be able to make it to the festival, I've scheduled all of those speakers to come later in the year so that you can hear their presentations. So tonight's guest is Charles Genghis. Charles is a retired commercial pilot turned full-time nature photographer who leads wildlife photography workshops to far and away exotic locations. Charles's images have been featured in publications and on media sites such as Birdwatching Daily, Northern Woodlands, and the popular birding app iBird. Um, they use his images in their North American and Mexico online guides. In tonight's presentation, Secrets to Making Captivating Images, Charles will share some of his favorite images and a few tips to help you create images that are unique and interesting while in the field. And maybe he'll help you start dreaming about your next travel adventure. You can see more of Charles's work on Instagram at charlesgangas.photography and on his website at charlesgangas.com. Welcome to the Happiness Hour Check. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Well, um, so first of all, I'm going to, uh, gosh, okay. So I always like to share how I found, found a speaker and how I convinced them to come and do my little bitty little photography project. Pop project. And you were no different. Uh, you were somebody, a photo came through my feed and went, hmm, I like this. And then I went to your page and noticed you had more. And then I noticed that you had a website. So I spent a little bit of time stalking your website. And um, then I sent my little, hi, my name's Linda. This is what I do. And, you know, sometimes people just don't see it. They don't respond. And it always surprises me because I always get more yeses than no's. And I always get more responses than being ignored. And you were one of those people that said, sure, let's talk about it. And so uh, we ended up talking for a little while. I actually was driving and, and um, I was not ready to get off the phone with you. So I pulled into a, um, a grocery store parking lot and I think we spent, I don't know, close to an hour on the phone. And I was just waiting for you to say, you know, I don't want to do this. And you just was like, yeah, let's do it. So here you are. And that was months ago, months ago. And um, one of the fun things that I hope I know that you've got pictures in here. Um, you were just in Uganda and Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was. I kept thinking. I keep saying Uganda, and I know it wasn't Uganda. It's no, no, it was. It was. It was both. It, it was, was both. both. Okay. Okay. Because you sent me a picture of, oh God, 
uh, it was a woods, it was an ugly, ugly stork, but I want to see that bird so badly. So I'm hoping you'll share that story yeah. with people. Oh, indeed. So, yes. So I spent four weeks in Uganda with yep. two photo workshops and then um, took a day off and went to Tanzania for another one and I got back last Thursday. Um, so I have fortunately and successfully escaped the cold winter of Vermont and spent the time down in uh, Equatorial Africa. <clears throat> yeah, quite a trip. Um, I hadn't been to Tanzania in 42 years. Um, I had gone there um, quite roundabout. Um, I was a uh, military pilot, um, years in, in a different life, and um, had an opportunity to visit Kenya. And um, when I was floating across the Indian Ocean on a big gray boat with a bunch of my squadron mates, the Kenyan uh, government offered anybody that was interested a three-day, two-night photo safari, or safari for $100. And uh, so me and about five or six of my mates decided that that's what we wanted to do. Uh, the boat pulled into the port city of Mombasa in Kenya, and then we went to southern Kenya right in the Serengeti and along the border of northern Tanzania. And as I was preparing for this trip, I, I went back in time and pulled out a couple of images that I had seen from 1980, so um, a lifetime ago. But uh, exciting to go. It was a phenomenal trip. Um, and uh, Yeah, it, it, was, it was quite exciting. So I'm guessing that the technology, the cameras have changed a little bit since, yeah, since sure. that first trip. <laughs> a funny story about that. Um, I shared a stateroom with, uh, with three other guys uh, in my squadron. And um, we each had our, our wall safe. And I had, uh, I had 36 rolls of film in it. And um, 36 rolls of 36 slides. And I took all of those and, uh, and used them and came back with 10 images that I put on the wall. So the keeper rate back in the day is probably about what it was and is today. But the beauty about today's technology, of course, is you, you can immediately see what you're getting and you can delete what you don't want rather than having to wait and wait and wait until the processing is complete and then go through your disappointments. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it, it's so much more fun to photograph now than it was back in the day, that's for sure. Well, I got a sneak peek of the photos that you have. So as soon as you want to jump in, uh, and you know what, I, I always gloss over, you know, I, when I do intros, I try just to hit some of the things that caught my eye. Is there something that you wanted people to know uh, about you that I may have missed? And if I did, I apologize. No, 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 no not at all. No. Okay. And I think right. if there are questions from anybody, I'm more than happy to, um, to address them and, and, and talk about uh, my journey and how I got to where I am. Um, and uh, if there's no interest, that's fine as well. Uh, it won't hurt my feelings. Um, I will watch the chat and I'll get any of those questions into you. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Because that's, that's the fun part is seeing pictures and the stories behind them. All right. So shall I introduce this first picture before I show it? Or shall I show it and introduce it at the same time? Whatever you'd like. This is your show. I'm just a bookend. All right. Well, this image um, I'm going to show right now, and I'll put it up on the screen. So this image I captured um, back in 2014. Um, I had mentioned earlier that um, I work for a group of people up here in, um, in Vermont that primarily do research on the Bicknell's thrush. So very melodious thrush that um, is under severe threat. It winters down in Española um, in the Dominican Republic and in, in, into Haiti. And it, and it breeds on, um, on mountain islands. And what I mean by mountain islands is uh, elevations above 3,500 feet. Um, the bird comes into the dense Krumholtz um, pine that we have up on the mountaintops. It, it's very thick, 
the bird uh, is extremely difficult to find. Um, and the individual that is spearheading uh, this project uh, has been working with this bird for now going on 31 years. He's one of the foremost experts in the world on the bird. His name is Chris Rimmer. And um, so through this group, um, I met a couple of ornithologists that came out from California that were interested in doing a, a guidebook of Northern New England and the Maritime Provinces. And they stopped in on the mountain and were interested in capturing images of the Bith. And um, I just started showing them around the mountain, going to the places I knew I could capture uh, reliable photos of this uh, bird. And I was invited to join them to go up into Quebec as they were venturing up to shoot puffins and northern gannets. And so this photo here comes from Bonaventure Island which is out near the Gaspé or in the Gaspé Peninsula, which is the very northern part of the St. Lawrence River that runs into the Bay of Fundy. And Bonaventure Island is about two miles off the coast of a town called Per Se. And you take a ferry out there, the Park Service runs the island, they do a phenomenal job. If you've ever visited a Canadian National Park, you'd be very impressed. Uh, they really maintain their parks well. And it's about a half hour walk up from the landing to the windward side of the island, which uh, houses the colony. And uh, there are about 40,000 breeding pairs, or at least there were when I visited seven or eight years ago. And I have an image in my mind that I wanted to take. And um, it was of these birds fencing. So this is a mating behavior. Um, and it occurs amongst this incredible cacophony of sound. You, you've got 40,000 breeding pairs, some of them bringing nesting materials, others squabbling, others are, are, are mating, others are birthing. Um, and this particular demonstration was, was of interest to me. And I sat down with my 500 millimeter and realized I had way too much lens. So I pulled out my 300 and I had to lean back quite a bit. But as I did that, it gave me a better perspective. You can see in the lower portion of the background, there's what would be the rest of the colony. Um, and I was just able to get a next shot of these two guys up against the blue sky. And it's been a fairly successful image for me. So I thought I'd start off with that. And let's see, shall we proceed? Yes, sir. All right. I just, lo I just love that their eyes match that sky blue. Uh, Beautiful. I can go back to it. Yeah, it, it, it is a compelling shot. And if you look at it very close up, the detail in the eyes themselves, they have concentric rings around the um, the iris, um, and, and, and it, 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 it's really a very, very interesting looking bird. This next bird is, is the bird in question that I was telling you about that, uh, that Chris Rimmer and his group up here have studied. This is a Bicknell's thrush. Um, there are three thrush up here. Th this guy used to be related to the gray cheek thrush, and uh, they've separated them into different species. Uh, the great sheet resides much further north in the boreal forests of Canada. But this guy is a high mountain dweller, has a beautiful melodious voice, and um, is a bird that's not really that well seen. And that's why there's a tremendous amount of interest by a lot of people that, that, uh, that know birds and uh, that uh, want to tick uh, a sighting off on their species list. So um, this image was captured real early in the morning. You can see the, the, the new sunlight just lighting the, uh, the, uh, the branch the bird is on. And um, it, it's, to me, um, a, a very good representative image of, of, of the bird in its habitat up here in Vermont. This image, um, many of you might recognize this bird. 
um, is a resplendent Quetzal. It's uh, one of the target birds for any birder or photographer going to Central America, primarily Costa Rica. Um, but it is found in, 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 in uh, a couple of other Central American countries as well. Uh, this image was captured real early in the morning. Um, it was um, up at a place called Paricio de Quetzal. It's up uh, in the Caldelaren Telemaca, which is the Caldelaren Mountains um, that uh, bridge Central America from Costa Rica into Panama. It's pretty high. It's up at about 85, 8,800 feet. And the morning I was out there was very brisk. Um, you can only spend about an hour with these birds when you go up there. Um, you usually check into a place like Paraiso. Um, they maintain a relationship with the local farmers and the, and the guides. The local farmers will call into the hotel when they see a, a, a Kate Sell on their property. And the guides will then take their clients the next morning to those particular farms so that your chances of seeing the bird are pretty good. The thing I like about this image is I, I recall the morning, I mean, I, I was set up on a tripod, it was windy, it was cold, um, and the wind blew the Kate Sal's tail in opposite directions. And I kept on seeing this, but I wasn't quite able to photograph it. So that was what I cued to. And I was just fortunate enough to get a burst when the wind hit, and the tail split, and that was my shot. So I think in, in looking at this, there are things that you can observe even while you're in the field um, about behavior, about certain things that are occurring that should inform you as to how you want to capture the image. And um, when it comes together, it's a great feeling. And if it doesn't, then you just store it in the back of your brain housing group and you try to go out and do it again the next time you have an opportunity. And this is not only for something as rare as a Quetzal, it could be the same for an American robin or, a, you, know, a, a, you know, a vermilion flycatcher or whatever the bird du jour might be. Uh, if you have a, 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 a vision of what you want to capture, then and try to put yourself in the position with which you can do that. And, and chances are you can make it happen. Uh, this image, a little close to home, um, which I, I wanted to include just because you don't have to travel to far away exotic places to get cool images. You can get cool images very close to home. This is um, an area on the Champlain, Lake Champlain, which is about an hour and 10 or 15 minutes from my home here. And it's a, a place called the Dead Creek Wildlife Management Area. It, 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 it's it's a, a body of water that flows into the Champlain. And there is a stone dam called the Stone Dam that holds back some water before it's released out into a tributary of the Dead Creek and flows out into the Champlain. I was set up to photograph great blue heron, I'm sorry, great blue egrets. And um, I was sitting on some rocks. I had my tripod splayed and I had a camouflage cover over my body. And I'm looking through the mesh to try to pick up some of, of, of the egrets that are flying about. And all of a sudden something caught my eye and I peered out um, a little further in the corner of the mesh and I saw this American mink. And I slowly repositioned the entire rig so that I was now facing it about 80 degrees from where I was presently positioned. And I did so in a fashion that did not spook him and I was able to pull off the shot. So sometimes things happen when you're not really quite expecting them and then and, and, and the the takeaway here is to try to be as flexible as possible, shift gears on the fly, and try to capture, you know, a, a relatively unique image. Um, you know, it, it was just one of those serendipitous things. So 
you know, you have to be attuned to that, I think. And, and uh, if you are, then you put yourself in a position of, of coming away with an image like that. Chuck, if Susan's curious, how far away was the mink from you? Uh, he was probably about um, 15, 18 feet. Okay. And that's what was so surprising to me because it had just come down from the dam, walking along the boulders and was just hunting for some fish that were in this, the, 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 these pool areas around, around these rocks. And um, yeah, quite unexpected. And I was just barely able to get him full frame with my 500 millimeter because I, I was looking for herons and egrets that, you know, were across, were across the creek. Very cool. I've never seen one. This is really cool. Yeah, they, they, they are cool. And they're very rare. I mean, I, I've, seen tw I've seen two in my travels in New England. One was down in Rhode Island. Um, and um, the other one was here. And uh, the attempt I made in Rhode Island to capture it was not successful. Uh, I got lucky this time. Uh, speaking of close to home, so this was right out my deck. Um, no more than about 20 feet from the slider that uh, goes right into my kitchen. Uh, I was dog sitting for a friend of mine the night before this image occurred. And as I came down the driveway, the dog in my right uh, passenger seat, I see this owl on a fence post right next to my deck. And we have them all around here. You can hear them at this time of the year. They're calling back and forth. But I never actually had one come into the yard. So I knew as soon as I got out of the vehicle and let the dog out, the bird was going to flush. And sure enough, that's what happened. So I didn't think anything of it. We got in the house. The next morning I got up, just before dawn, and the bird was perched in a tree that was right off my deck. And I put my 70 to 200 on my rig. I opened the slider and I took this image. And he wasn't more than about 20 feet from me. So I guess the story here is that you can get compelling images right at home. All you have to do is look for them. And what I liked about this, I made a Christmas card of this one year. I mean, I just love the, the snow that's on, on the branches and the fact that you can tell it was really cold because birds, when they're cold, fluff out for insulation. And if you look fairly close at this image, well, there's snow up on the brow and on some other parts of its, of its body. So that was the story with this image, and it was fun, fun to capture. And uh, I didn't have to go very far for it, so um, that was kind of cool. Okay, here is the bird that you were looking to see. Mm -hmm. I want to start uh, the next several images um, talking about birding and photographing primarily in inclement weather. Uh, we, could, we could talk about the previous image as, as a segue into that because it was obviously very cold, it had snowed, but I really wasn't out in the elements. I was fortunate enough to be able to take the shot from my kitchen table. But this scene was um, just recently in Uganda at a place called uh, um, uh, Bama, wetlands. It's outside of Entebbe by about an hour. And there's a huge complex of wetlands. <clears throat> and uh, you go to this area and they have these old wooden longboats with an outboard motor on the back of it. And there's a guide up in front and a driver in the back. They have some long wooden poles in there as well. Because as you progress from the channel into this marshland area, the waterways get more restrictive and restrictive and restrictive. And in point of fact, on several occasions, one of the guys had to get out of the boat and actually push it. Um, this was the first of two um, photo shoots I did, one with each of the groups that I had. 
And it was very, very rainy when we got there. Uh, we had rain gear on, we had rain gear on our equipment. And the thing I like most about this image, as you can see as I blow it up, you can see some rain here in the background, but right off the nail of the beak is a drop of water. And the rest of the bird is extremely wet. And to me, photographing in inclement weather can offer some very compelling and dramatic images. And this is one example. It happens to be with a very, very iconic bird. Here's another image from Africa I shot. Um, oh, this goes back maybe four or five years ago. Again, in my mind's eye, I had had a, a picture of a giraffe reaching for some food. And uh, they reach out these large acacia trees or whatever else is leafy vegetation. And they have, as you can see, black tongues, which I don't know if many people realize, um, but they're kind of unusual. And uh, again, this image taken in the rain, um, you can partially see some of the rain here. If, if you were right up close, you, you, you definitely could. But um, I waited and waited and waited in the back of a safari vehicle, um, getting absolutely drenched until this guy offered the opportunity I was looking for, and I just took the image. And, and again, one of my favorites. Uh, this, again, in Vermont, uh, off of uh, Lake Champlain, this uh, image was captured last February, a year ago. Um, I had just come back from uh, knee replacement surgery and I was about five or six months uh, post-surgery and, and felt well enough to be able to try to get out with the camera and, and do some photography. So I grabbed my wife and the two of us went out to uh, the Dead Creek area. And uh, there is an area out there that's fairly vast and it has a lot of ravines that in the summertime are filled with water that drain into the Champlain and a few of its, um, its tributaries. And in the wintertime, the short-eared owls come out and they cruise the ravines. So if you place yourself properly after watching their flying patterns, you can put yourself in a position to try to get a head-on shot of some one of these guys. And uh, that's what I was able to do here. Very cold. Uh, I had um, heavy winter boots on. I had uh, crampons so that I wouldn't slip on the ice trying to protect my, my uh, newly reconstructed knee. And um, if you've ever photographed in cold weather, it can, be, it can be challenging, not only on your equipment, but also on your body. Primarily, your hands get very cold. And I have, um, I have gloves that I, that, I, that I use for that, um, that, um, that are like a mitten, but the mitten falls back and you can attach uh, the, the, the mitten portion on the top of your fist. And then there are, um, there's a glove insert. And then there's also a spot in the top of the palm for heat um, uh, hand warmers. So I have hand warmers in my glove and I'm trying to stay as warm as I can. But if you're out for a couple of three hours waiting for these guys to uh, come about and it's in the teens or lower, you get pretty cold pretty fast. This, um, obviously, uh, from Uganda, um, this was one of the highlights of, 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 of the trip that I just made. Um, I was fortunate enough to make three treks for these gorillas. Um, we went to a place in Western Uganda, um, called Rushaga Gorilla Lodge, which is right on the edge of the Bwindi Impenetrable Forest, which is where these guys are. Um, I think the rangers follow 42 troops uh, or, or small families of gorillas, 13 or 14 of which are habituated to people, and those are where the guides bring you. So they have guys in the field that are tracking the movement of these families, and they report back in the morning before the crowds come in. You show up at around 7 o'clock or so. You uh, check in. 
the local uh, native community comes out and, and does a performance for you, which is quite nice and, and, and very entertaining. Uh, and then you're assigned the troop. And fortunately for me uh, and my group, uh, many of us were in our 60s and 70s. They prioritize uh, the age of the groups so that the closest troops they find are the ones they give to the older folks. And that's a good thing because it's extremely challenging to get in to see these guys. Um, the first time I went in was only a 45 minute hike, but it was down this very, very steep hill to a draw with some water down below. Uh, the vegetation, as you can see, is extremely dense. It's wet, it's muddy. Um, <clears throat> you wanna wear gaiters, you want to wear gloves because if you slip, you're going to grab onto something and chances are it has thorns on it or is, is somewhat sharp and unpleasant to grab barehanded. But the thrill of being close to an animal like this um, is just indescribable. And they're very passive. They're going about their business. Obviously, this guy's eating. I was probably about uh, 20 feet from him, 25 feet at most. I had one of the babies run right next to me. I, I mean, right next to me, a, a foot away, and, and was not at all concerned that I was there. Um, but you are respectful of their space. Um, you just let them go about what they're doing, and they're very happy to let you photograph. Um, what I wanted to do instructionally um, with respect to this image, although the subject is fairly open and, and not much of a challenge, but is with this one. And that is trying to get the right focus on your subject when there is vegetation or some other obstruction that comes between you and the subject. Now, when I saw this black-shouldered kite, I, I really liked the way the vegetation framed it. So what I was hoping for was exactly what happened. I wanted a head-on encounter. When I first saw this guy, his head was out looking this way and that, and he was just basically checking out everything. And then all of a sudden, he presented himself head-on, and I took this image. But with the camera that I was using, um, I had to make sure that I used spot focus so that I could grab right on to the head. And once I did that, the autofocus in the rig was then able to capture the eye. And I was able to get decent focus, but I couldn't do it with the setting that I had originally. Um, I, I may back up and say that I was very fortunate. I was one of the first folks here in North America to get the Z9 in December. And I took that camera with me on this past trip. And um, it's the first time I shot with mirrorless. I had been resisting going to any of the previous Nikon images, uh, uh, cameras, because they just, in my opinion, weren't quite ready for prime time with respect to wildlife. Uh, but from what I was researching on the Z9, I, I, I figured that they we're going to pretty much have it dialed in. And sure enough, they did. I spent uh, two weeks with the camera before I went in country and uh, got very conversant with it. And it allowed me to take some phenomenal images only because I spent the time before I went to learn the capabilities of the camera and to acclimate myself to it and, and, and incorporate the features into my shooting style. And, and that, offers me a segue to get into something that I wanted to, to speak about. Um, and that is, it's really important um, if you're interested in, in pursuing photography in, in any meaningful way, that you take the time to learn the features of your camera. And I can't tell you how many times I have people come to workshops with new rigs or with cameras that they've had for a while. 
but they're just not conversant with the features of the camera and what it can do for them in terms of the various scenarios they encounter. So I would encourage everybody to take the time to research the features of, of their equipment, get to, get to work with, 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 with the features to your style of shooting so that when an opportunity like this presents itself, you don't catch focus on something in front of the bird or in front of the animal and lose the opportunity. Um, and in that vein, there's a couple of other things that I, I wanted to speak about, um, just roughly saying, and, and, and I've been photographing wildlife now and birds particularly for over 15 years. Um, and I make these mistakes myself. I kick myself all the time because I just know better, but I just forgot to do it. And that is, check your camera every day and zero it out. And even in between shoots, and what I mean by zeroing it out is that make sure that you're at a good place with respect to your shutter speed and aperture. Also with your ISO. If you've used exposure compensation, zero that back out. There are so many times that people will be taking an image of a static bird or a static subject, and they'll be shooting at one four hundredths of a second, one five hundredths of a second, and then all of a sudden something really fast erupts and they just forget to go for speed. And they don't get a very crisp image because they just did not have the speed to arrest the action. So I'm always mindful of what my settings were from when I just took the image. And certainly in the morning when I get up and before I get to the van or I get in my vehicle and, and start shooting, I check to see my settings. And usually I'll start out with a generic setting like an aperture of 5.6 with an F4 or maybe 6.3 with a 5.6 camera uh, lens. Um, one five hundredths of a second if I have the light and ISO that supports that speed. I am a manual auto ISO kind of photographer. I shoot that way about 95% of the time. And I also shoot handheld. The only time I use any kind of a tripod or monopod, particularly a tripod, will be if I'm in a photo blind or if I'm shooting multi-flash for hummingbirds in Costa Rica or Ecuador. Other than that, I shoot handheld. And I, I do that because I find it's easier for me to get on the subject. Um, and I'm much more flexible but I'm able to do it. I'm able to handle a 500 millimeter um, handheld. And I know that that's a stretch with some people, but the good thing about that is the lenses that are now coming out are much lighter weight. Um, there are smaller systems like a four third system that you can get that, that's much lighter. That allows people that, that like me get up in age and, and, and start losing a little bit of their strength. So anyway, I wanted to get that in. Sorry, Linda, that it was long winded, but. No, 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 that's helpful. Uh, another shot here again with trying to fine tune your autofocus in order to get the shot. So you can see this vegetation all around this guy. I had a very, very limited window to get him, but I, I, wanted, I wanted to try to find a shot like this that, 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 that spoke to me with respect to the nature of the animal. I mean, I, I have good eye contact. Uh, and he's got a, 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 a pensive sort of, of, of pose, even though he is eating. Um, and I had to get the focus point right on the eye. And uh, I was able to do that. And the, the image, in my, in my opinion, works. At least it works for me. I do a lot of photography in a kayak. I have a fishing kayak that has a relatively wide beam. It's got a trimaran hull. It's extremely stable. And although I could probably cast a fly rod standing up in it, I don't. I just make sure that I'm seated properly. But I can get in the kayak and move myself around from side to side. 
We have, uh, let me interrupt you real quick. The photo I'm looking at, it looks yes. like not quite centered or maybe, what am I looking at? Is that a duck? No, it is a loon. Okay. Okay. This, loon, this, duck. This, but, is, this is a common loon. Right. And what you have here is the chick that he oh, had on, okay. on its mom's back okay. and plucked itself in the middle of the two feathers or the two wings. Okay. And if you look real closely here from the feet, you can see there's some water that sprayed up. Um, I just I just find this just whimsical. To me, it's it, it was it was just kind of a unique behavioral capture. Um, I know it's a stretch to really discern what it might be, but once you see it, you can see the eye of the chick, you can see its little wings, and you can see it kicked up on mom's back for a ride. Uh, I can see it now. I, I was like, all right, what, what am I looking at? Okay, sorry. No, I'm sorry. I, 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 yeah, I wanted to keep up. <laughs> I it earlier, but the reason I posted it is um, that with, with a boat, with a kayak or a canoe, you can get really close to water birds. And uh, the boat, like a car, acts like a blind. And there have been times where I've gone after loons that I've actually had to backpedal because I've had too much lens on them. So I'm sorry, I should have introduced this a little earlier so that you weren't contorting yourself trying to figure out what it was, but. I thought, well, it flipped over. I just, yeah, I never saw the eye. I, I thank you for, I'm glad I asked. Well, and um, well, I've already interrupted you. Darling no. had a question and she wanted to know if you could just talk about your focus technique that you're using. Is that because you're using the new eye focus in the, in the Z9? Yeah. Or? Well, um, I started this technique um, when Nikon in the, in, the, in the D5 and the D500 revolutionized their autofocus system. And what they were able to do is offer a variety of focus um, uh, options and allow you to program those options with programmable buttons in the front of the camera. Um, <clears throat> I find that absolutely essential for the type of photography I do. Um, I'm on animals and birds very quickly. I have to get a real quick focus and I have to be able to track that focus. But one size doesn't fit all. So what I do is I take the focus modes that I use the most and I program them in the programmable buttons so that I could easily switch between one and the other or several of them without taking my eye from the viewfinder uh, or you know, otherwise fidgeting for a different focus mode. So usually when I was using the D500, I would use the dynamic range, which is one center focus point and a myriad of helper focus points around there, which if the subject moved outside of the primary focus point, it would pass the focus off to a helper B, if you will, as long as the array was still on the subject. And then they also had a very cool focus mode called group autofocus, which was uh, eight focus points, which you could use to track your subject across the view of, of, of the sensor um, while you were panning. And I found that very, very helpful with birds in flight and, and, and other fast moving um, subjects. And then on another of the buttons, I would program single point focus for those hard to find focus shots that I was showing earlier, where you have uh, a subject behind some obstruction and you have a small window, but you need to be able to be precise with respect to your focus point. So with the Z9 and the um, eye detection, animal eye detection, bird eye detection, automobile eye detection, um, detection um, that's available, I have um, my default setting 
in wide area mode, which is a box in the frame, in the sensor. And anything that is inside that box is live and captured. So if the subject is anywhere within that box, it's going to, it's going to lock on. If it sees the head, it will lock onto the head. If it sees the eye, it will pinpoint the eye. If the subject moves, it will get the back of the head. But in some instances, it doesn't do any of those things and I need to help it. And what I'll do then is I'll grab one of my fingers with the pre-programmed button and I'll squeeze the single focus point and get right where I want it to be. And nine times out of 10, I can release it. And now the large area autofocus will take over. You can also contract that into a small area autofocus, or you can expand it into auto area autofocus, which is the entire frame. But um, I don't like doing that because the camera then decides what it wants to focus on. And I don't want to give the camera any more control than I have to. Uh, there's a third method called 3D autofocus. It allows you to pick up the subject and then it will follow the subject by itself throughout the entire frame. Um, I follow a gal up in Canada. She's an Nikon ambassador by the name of Michelle Wahlberg. And when she was testing this camera, when Nikon gave it to the uh, ambassadors, um, she was on her kayak and was raving about 3D autofocus mode in the Z9. And I quite didn't get the excitement. Um, I found that in my six weeks with the camera, I was primarily shooting between large area autofocus and the single point autofocus and going in between the two. And it served me extremely well. I was able to get some really compelling images, I think. Um, but again, <clears throat> it goes to learning your equipment taking the time to see what the camera can do for the type of photographer you are, and then just going out and playing with it. I spent two weeks on my deck photographing birds coming into my bird feeder. That's how I went between the autofocus points and just played with it. So I hope that answers her question. And if not, if there's a follow-on, I'll, I'll be certain. Okay, I'll watch for one. Okay, this image here, um, again on the kayak, at a reservoir that's not very far from here, about 10, 15 miles away, out one afternoon, and notice the spotted sandpiper. So it wasn't a very birdie afternoon, so I focused in on him, and I noticed that he was looking up, and he was actually leaping. And you can see here that he's got one leg up. And this is before the leap, but I captured this image. And then when I got home and I put it out on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the computer, I noticed the fly up here in the upper left-hand corner. And I hadn't seen that when I took the image. So that was obviously what he was looking for. And um, so sometimes when you see something, you don't see it all. So if you find something interesting, just shoot away and then explore what you've got when you get home. This was a fun image. Uh, these are black-headed gonolics. They're a very attractive bird. They're found in Western Uganda. And um, I was out at a lodge that was next to the tented camp that we were, we were staying. And the lodge had a beautiful balcony, veranda type thing that looked out on some vegetation. And these birds were flying back and forth. And I noticed one and then its partner came in and then I captured them in a duet. So sometimes you get lucky and you get a decent image. These are lovebirds. These are Fisher's lovebirds. Uh, uh, these are from Tanzania. They're cavity nesters. So this was an old trunk. There were numerous cavities in the trunk. And as we were driving down and, and around, we were on an elan, which is the largest antelope in the world. And we were tracking that. And all of a sudden, someone in the vehicle spotted these lovebirds. There were about a dozen of them. So we shifted focus onto the lovebirds. And um, this is apparently a behavior that they're noted for, um, therefore the name. 
Um, this is a martial eagle, and, and I, I, I bring this in. It's an interesting story. Um, in Western Uganda, up against the border of Congo, in an area called Semliki, Semliki National Park. And we were out on a, a morning game drive and um, not quite ready for it. But all of a sudden, this guy just came right down on the side of the track and just pounced. And he was looking for something that he didn't quite get. And he stayed for about three or four frames. And I was able to get this image. But the reason I'm posting this is because I was thinking of the subsequent images that I took. And since he was so close, as he flew off, I didn't get the entire bird. So what I did find was this. And so I thought that might be an interesting look. And so sometimes you can look at, at images that don't quite make it one way and feature something in another. And, and obviously here you look at the tarsi and you look at uh, you look at the talons. It's a pretty strong bird, and um, I found that to be a worthy image. So don't be at all afraid to experiment with your images. You know sometimes it doesn't work in a conventional sense. Look at it in a different fashion. Look for headshots. Look at for um, I, I took a shot in Galapagos with with a Galapagos tortoise. And all I have is its foot. And next to it is a Galapagos yellow warbler. And I juxtaposed the two, the big, huge tortoise foot and the small little bird in, in the image. And it, and, it, and, it, and it works. So if you find that there's something in the image that didn't quite work, look a little closer and you may find something that you can use. Um, this is an image that I took one morning when we visited a lagoon that had um, lots of shorebirds, um, this again in Uganda. And what struck me here was the texture and the ripples in the water. This is a black wing stilt, and it was just out foraging. It's obviously backlit. Uh, it wasn't the best location for the time of day that we went, but I was trying to make the best of it. And um, I captured this and I thought it worked. At least it works for me. So don't be at all afraid to experiment. Do things slightly unconventionally. You may come up with a workable image. Same here. Um, we were visiting Tanzania during the migration. Hundreds, actually the count is about 2 million plus wildebeest and a couple of 300,000 zebra, all kinds of antelope. They're all over the plains. And we came across this dry lake area and this herd was moving through. They weren't doing anything special. I was kind of bored. And then all of a sudden I realized that <clears throat> there was a little activity going on. So I got out of my conventional mode and I slowed the shutter speed down to about 1 40th of a second. Now I just panned with this guy. I opened, uh, I stopped down on the aperture. I think I was about uh, F11 here, F9. And so at any rate, um, there's just something to do, something different. And sometimes it works. I would have preferred to have tried to get a whole moving herd. Um, I, I didn't quite pull that off. Um, but again, don't be afraid to get outside the box. And, and, and look at different ways to capture things. A tree, a leopard, and on the opposite end, it's kill. So we didn't see the kill. We didn't see the leopard dragging the antelope up into the tree. When we got on this, there are dozens of vehicles around. We were able to position, but this was a very distant shot. Uh, I took this with my 500 millimeter and a 1.4 teleconverter to get the reach I needed, full frame. And um, it, it tells a pretty interesting story, I think. I've never captured a leopard in a tree with prey. So that was a first for me. And um, 
Again, this is how these guys make their living. Uh, Tanzania again. Uh, we went to a place in, in Uganda called Nshasa, which is uh, on, in the western part of the country, specifically for lions and trees. Uh, they were found in, in, in a place near Queen Elizabeth Park. We were there for three days. We saw one lion. It wasn't in a tree. It wasn't until we went to Tanzania that we saw all kinds of lions and trees, which was really kind of fun. So what I opted to do here is to try to frame this lioness and again, waited to get a direct look. I was fortunate, got that and, and took the shot. A cheetah and her cub, a compelling story. We were radioed um, in the safari vehicle that there was a cheetah with her cubs. And we went across the other side of the park. It had rained the night before. The tracks were completely wet. It was a very harrowing drive. We had a very, very, very skillful driver. Fortunately, we didn't get stuck. And we came across this area where there was a tree and these tall grasses. And there were at least 20, maybe 25 vehicles that were all around this, this area. But we couldn't see a thing. But we were told that there were cheetahs in here. We waited three hours. Many people came and went. But you could tell the people that were intent on trying to grab the image. Most of them had large glass and they sat by patiently waiting because they knew that there was a better than even chance that the cheetahs were going to show themselves. And sure enough, towards the latter part of the afternoon, as the light was starting to diminish, Mrs. Cheetah pops up and so does her little cub. And that right there made the wait worthwhile. And here are the two of them as they show themselves. So again, if you photograph wildlife, one basic rule, be patient. This was a surprise. Uh, this is in the Ngorongoro Crater. A phenomenal place. It's the largest indented or collapsed crater in the world. It's about 30 kilometers across, walls all the way around it. It is a compelling, compelling piece of, of, of landmass. Um, we had two mornings in and two afternoons there. And uh, on the first morning in, one of the people in the vehicle spots this cat. And it was quite a ways away, at least a half a mile away. And we were paralleling its track. But the sun was in front of us. The animal was um, parallel. And we couldn't really get a decent shot. So I saw that there was a track that went perpendicular to the direction, in other words, another 90 degrees, that would put us in a position that if the cat kept on coming in the direction it was going, we would be in a position to get a better shot. So sure enough, we positioned the vehicle, I had the driver stop, and we waited for about 20 minutes. And sure enough, the caracal came right up, and I was able to capture this image. Look. But skill in knowing that when you follow animals, you don't want to follow them. You want to get ahead of them. You want to predict where they're going to be and put yourself in that place that as that subject starts coming towards you, you are able to get the image. I see people taking images of birds and animals from the back quarters on, and 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 it 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 isn't it is not a successful image in most instances. My rule of thumb, particularly for for birds in flight, is once the bird gets directly in front of me, I'll follow through with the movement, but I'm not shooting anymore because I really don't want to see the back end of the bird. 
unless there's some compelling reason for me to see the back end of the bird. Uh, same with animals. So on several occasions over the course of, of numerous tours that I've led, um, I've employed this tactic with troops of macaws, uh, I'm sorry, macaques, um, lions, this curricul, um, anything, uh, any kind of herd movement, you want to get out in front of it if you can. So if you're out at a local park and you see, I don't know, deer or moose or elk or whatever it is you might be capturing, just try to predict where this guy's going and put yourself in a position with which you intercept him and not follow him. Creatures don't like to be followed. And when they know you're following them, they move out even faster. So just, just a little bit of, uh, of advice with respect to uh, trying to put yourself in a position for, for a decent capture. This is the last image in, in the presentation and, and, and perhaps sums up my six weeks in Africa more than any other one image. <clears throat> last day in the Ngorongor crater, um, my wife and the two other participants decided that they didn't want to come on this drive early morning. I got up a half hour earlier with my, with my driver and the two of us went in by ourselves. And as I'm driving in the back of the vehicle, uh, we were in a land cruiser with a pop-up top and I'm standing up and I look over my left shoulder and I see the east rim of the crater and I see this lone elephant, and on top of its back, it's got, it's got a cattle eager. And I thought, this to me is Africa. And I took a vertical shot with my 500, and I wanted the ridge line. I wanted some of the sky, a little drama with the cloud cover at the top, and then the whole front of the crater down to the floor. And, you know, I, 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 I can't speak for anybody else, but for me, th this, this speaks Africa to me. And uh, that's all I've got. That's a lot, Chuck. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna get you to take down your screen. And I saw one question here, I've got to go back and find it. Um, it was Kurt. And I think it goes back to you were, uh, you said that you do a lot of photography from your kayak. And, you know, there were quite a few uh, images that you showed that were birds in water or you're near water. Kurt wanted to know, is there anything special that you do to protect your gear? No, not really. Um, just don't get it wet. <laughs> I was looking for the secret sauce. Um, all right. Secret sauce is, is all right. Let, let me. Let, uh, I didn't mean to be so flippant, and 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 uh, I, I can explain. If if it's raining, if I'm out in the rain, then I'll certainly put um, rain sleeve on. I, I like um, I like Think Tanks hydroponic. Um, it's a great piece of gear. Um, I use it for my 500. I use it for my 300 if I'm shooting that. Um, it, I just find it. It's a, a, a of all of the rain gear that I've had for cameras, it is by far and away the best that I've used. That having been said, <clears throat> I go out in my kayak with a dry bag, but I don't have a conventional dry bag. My dry bag has a zipper, a weatherized zipper. So I can put it in between my legs on the uh, deck of the kayak, open it up, and when I'm not shooting, I can put it in there and zip it up if I'm paddling from one place to another. If the water happens to be, and, and I have a flat water boat, so I have to be very careful when the wind kicks up in large open lakes, because if the wakes start coming up over a foot or so, it can lap into the boat. So I have to be cautious with that. But ordinarily, no, I, I usually try to pick calm wind weather days um, so I get out with a nice reflective surface. I like early mornings, late afternoons, so I get as close to the golden hour as I can. 
Um, but no, I just, um, I, I think the, the, the key to, to photographing from a kayak is to have a stable kayak. And, 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 and that, that really, um, that rules out sea kayaks um, because they're too narrow and, and they're, they're, they're unstable. You can flip one of those extremely quickly. Um, you'd have to do quite a bit to, to flip my kayak. As I said, it's got a trimaran type hull, so it's extremely stable. Uh, it's got a wide, um, it, 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 it's it's got a um, a wide berth. It's twenty two or twenty three inches at the widest part, so I can swing my rig from side to side, and then if I need some support, I'll slouch down in the seat, and I'll put the rig right on the gunnel uh, or the side of, of the kayak for a little extra stability. Now, I've seen people try to go out with monopods. I've seen them try to go out with tripods. I don't subscribe to that. Um, and the reason for that is they're too restrictive. Um, you really, you, you put it on a monopod, you can't get your rig down low. You can't get it really up high. So you're really limited in terms of your, your, uh, your shooting area. Um, but it takes quite a while to get comfortable, first of all, with going out in a kayak with your equipment. Um, and then perfecting your technique. Um, I, I just find that I can be very quiet on the boat and move around without, without jeopardizing um, um, myself uh, in terms of, of capsizing. I was looking through here looking for any. There's so many nice comments that I can't sift through here to see if there are any questions. I don't think I missed anything. So any any you've been talking for a while. Is there anything you want to close with? Because I'm... A, I'm, I'm going to probably shut down your session, but I, I wanted to say um, when I introduced you, it was, you know, um, maybe he'd get you to start dreaming of your next travel adventure. And you have done that for me. I'm just sitting on my hands because I'm ready to travel. And um, the shoe, is it a shoe bill stork? Yes, that's I, what I just think that is one of the most fascinating birds and um, I thank you for sharing that particular photo because we had talked about it. So I'm, yeah. I'm tickled to have that as part of your, your I think, presentation. I, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I realize I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate and in an evil spot in being able to do what I do and, and go where I go. And I feel very blessed that I'm at a point in my life where I'm actually able to do that. Um, that having been said, I, you know, I, I've traveled all my life. Um, I started in the Marine Corps when, when I was when I was much younger out of college. And then I was involved with a profession, obviously, that traveled. Um, so for me, it's it, travel is, is, is what I've done. But that having been said. You don't have to travel very far to get good, compelling images. You just need to pay attention to key factors. You want to be mindful of your, of, of what, and I've, I've, I've discussed this, what your equipment can do for you. You want to be cognizant of your light. Um, go out in, 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 in ordinarily bad weather just to see if there's something that you can find that's compelling. Uh, think outside the box. Um, and go out and shoot whatever you can find because there's always another image to be had and you don't have to travel halfway around the world to get it. Um, but if you are fortunate enough to do that, then, then that's wonderful. And there's a whole other list of things that I can talk to about preparing for that. But I think that gets beyond where we are right now. Tonight it might be, but maybe another <laughs> maybe another time I'll reel you in. Um, so one of the things that I touched on was, I mean, I know this, and I think that if anyone's looked, they know that you do workshops. Do you want to share a little bit about how people can reach you and maybe some of the, the things sure. that you do? Sure. I work for a fellow by the name of Nate Chapel, who lives in um, Missouri City, not too far outside of Houston. 
So he's a Texan. Actually, he's a transplanted Texan. He's a, he's from Seattle, but um, I um, I do um, a few of his South American tours. Um, I do Costa Rica for him, and 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 for the company, Africa, and Thailand. Uh, primarily, those are the spots that I've been going. Um, you can find me through Trogan Photo Tours, or you can go on my Instagram account, and there's a link, I believe, to Trogan Tours there. And you can look at the very extensive offerings that Nate has put together. When I first started with him five years ago, we didn't have anywhere near as many. So he's brought a few other guides in from all over the world. Uh, we are probably we probably do um, more South American tours than any one company that, that I'm familiar with. Um, so I am scheduled to go to Colombia in April. Um, I am scheduled to go to Thailand, although that looks iffy. And, and the reason Thailand looks iffy is because of the situation in Myanmar and, and I think the, the, the pandemic is, is still uh, affecting those guys in a, in a big way. Uh, I'm scheduled um, to go to South Africa in September with a Botswana extension. Um, there's a saying about Africa, if you can at all swing it in your lifetime, you owe it to yourself to raid the piggy bank. My wife came across this in one of her readings, and I'll leave it with your audience. Once you get the dust of South Africa on your boots, you can never shake, or Africa on your boots, you can never shake it off. And uh, I say South Africa because that's when she had told me from a reading there. But it's the it's the whole it's the whole continent, at least sub sub Sahara Africa is. Um, I've just come back. I'd pack tomorrow and go again. It is, it's, 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 just, it's just a phenomenal place. Uh, if you're a wildlife photographer, um, and as I said, and, and, and you can possibly swing it, it's, it's well worth it. And if you can't, the second best thing is going on the Nature Channel and following their programming because their cinematography is superb. And I and I and I, I I do that all the time myself, even though I get out in the field and 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 and, and actually photograph. So yeah, you can live os uh, ostensibly through them as well. But um, so that's primarily what I do, and I have a Galapagos trip coming up in November. Um, that's that's an interesting area as well. Lots of fun things um, to look forward to this year for you. Chuck, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming and doing this. And I know it's one of those things, you know, you're talking to a room full of strangers, but we are also appreciative of your time. And I, I, me in particular, because you, you've had to have a, had a couple of conversations with me and they're never really short. So I, I truly appreciate your time and your friendship. So guys, you can connect with Chuck through his website, charlesgangas.com. And on Instagram, you can find him at charlesgangas.photography. Next week, we are off because I'll be preparing for the in-person happiness hour in Georgetown, but we'll return on Wednesday, March 23rd with Phil Gold. Phil wrote the book, 365 Photography Days, which began the 365 photo a day challenge that we see today. So he'll share his story. And his presentation, Life Behind the Lens. And until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon.